Hello, I'm Claire Machikowski, a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for being with us. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive opportunities to network with guests and preference when applying for our internship assistance or for paid student positions at the Institute. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us. From April 1st through the 7th, the Dole Institute, as a member of the Association of Centers for the Study of Congress, recognizes National Congress Week, which commemorates the convening of the first session of Congress in 1789. The Dole Institute will be participating in Congress Week via social media throughout the week to promote understanding of Congress and the importance of its study. Please join us on Facebook, Twitter, and through our weekly email. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy today's program, please let us know. Our past and future programs are available to watch on video on our website. We'd like to encourage each of you to get special benefits and support the Dole Institute by becoming friends with the Dole Institute. Let us know if you are interested. I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the program, we will have time for questions and answers. If you have a question, raise your hand and a student helper will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. And now, please welcome Director Bill Lacey. Thank you, Claire. Thanks to all of you for coming out uh, this afternoon for this program that is going to be uh, very interesting and informative. Uh, let me remind everybody that tonight at 7.30 we'll be hosting our student advisory program uh, for advisory board program for spring. Uh, it will be on income inequality and will be a moderated discussion uh, between two very different perspectives on that issue. So it should be very interesting, a lot of fun. Let me also say that we'll be doing a book sale and a book signing immediately after today's session. So if you want to pick up any uh, wonderful gifts for, we just had Easter, so the 4th of July or Memorial Day or next Christmas, you can certainly do that. Uh, and I know I plan on picking up uh, a copy for, uh, for Susie and me. Our guest today has a very long biography, and I'm not going to really, I'm going to save the time for our discussion and your questions. Uh, but I'll just briefly tell you to read the bio on your program. Uh, he has a very interesting and a very diverse background. But I'll share with you that Tom Reed was Secretary of the Air Force in the Ford and Carter administrations, the youngest ever director of the NRO, which was the agency that managed, at the time, U.S. satellite intelligence systems, and was a special assistant to the President for National Security in the Reagan White House. As I said, you'll find out a lot more details about Tom, uh, from your uh, program, but please welcome him to the Dole Institute of Politics and the University of Kansas. Thank you. Tom, thanks for joining us today, and let's, let's start with basic uh, information. Tell us about yourself, your education, and your career. Well, first of all, Bill, I'm really delighted to be here, not just to have folks who will listen to me talk. <clears throat> I have family in Wichita. Uh, my my mother's family came from upstate New York, south of Buffalo, but uh, one of the, my five uncles uh, during the big war was such a reprobate that they urged him to go to Kansas and harvest wheat and not come back. And uh, he settled in Wichita, and if you've been to Wichita, his name was Ed Bradley, and there's a place called Bradley Farms. It's now a shopping center, and that was his farm. Uh, that we had a lot of fun in Wichita. Uh, amongst the things I also did at that time was uh, I got to meet a, a congressman named Bob Dole, who I've known for, knew for a very long time. Uh, let's see, education. I was born in the East and had lots of ice and snow. I uh, was sent to Cornell, more ice and snow. The U.S. Air Force saved me. Korea was going on. I got my commission at Cornell. <coughs> the, uh, my orders sent me to Edwards Air Force Base out in the California desert, no ice and snow. So I stayed there, went to graduate school at USC, then went, uh, did physics. My graduate degree was in engineering physics, did uh, physics uh, and became weapons physics at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, fired a couple of nuclear devices, fired in the Pacific in the mid-60s. Uh, then uh, I started a high-tech company, uh, but I also got involved in politics. Uh, I had been in the Air Force and I had friends uh, that were in the Air Force that, were, that did not come back from, from Vietnam, even though it allegedly wasn't going on. And, uh, and so I, I got interested in politics, uh, became an advanced man in 1964 in that capacity, sitting in a hotel room in Pittsburgh, 
Uh, I heard the famous time for choosing speech. <clears throat> I thought Ronald Reagan really was quite remarkable. He, he, he had the ability to, to concisely develop what it was he was trying to say and the things he said about the nation's security really struck home. Uh, when the election was over, I wrote him a letter and said, I hope you run for office, and if you do, I'd be glad to help. I know something about that, and I got a day job, so you don't need to pay me much. And uh, he put that in a stack of letters that were uh, <clears throat> the interesting mail file. And uh, when he started getting organized in the summer of 65, um, I, I was invited to meet with him and then do some advance work for his visits to Modesto and stuff like that. And apparently I seemed to make sense uh, to him because in September of 1965, uh, I was a volunteer from the North, a fellow named Denny Carpenter from Orange County, to profess to professional Spencer and Roberts, uh, a, uh, his, Reagan's brother, Neil, and Reagan's minister and his wife all met in Reagan's home to kick off, to crystallize, crystallize what this campaign would be. And it kicked out and kicked off in early 66. And I was the Northern California chairman and manager for that campaign. Uh, when it was over, uh, I, had, I really was impressed with Reagan's political talent as well as his moral sense. Uh, and I was also impressed with a million vote margin, which is a lot of votes, even in California. And so I became uh, convinced that he was the man that ought to run for president in 1968. I was very young, so I knew, number one, that Lyndon Johnson was going to run again, and number two, Richard Nixon couldn't win anything, and so we needed a candidate. And so I thought that Reagan would be the one, so I put together and ran a, a presidential nomination drive in 68 that almost succeeded. It was a very dicey thing because conventions, it's kind of hard to count, but basically the convention in Miami, uh, things hinged on a couple of state chairmen. Uh, we did not uh, prevail. Uh, but Reagan then asked me to run his reelection campaign in 1970. Uh, I did. I was the state chairman and the manager of that. Uh, and then through with that, I basically said, no more politics. I'm going to take the cure, and I returned to high-tech stuff. I uh, got recruited to the Pentagon by Jim Schlesinger, who I'd known. Cure before. didn't stick, though, did it? No. <laughs> <laughs> you got back into politics. I got back, well, I got back briefly. Then I, I went to the Pentagon, did high-tech stuff. Um, in telecommunications and NSA and satellites and so forth. Um, I became Secretary of the Air Force having nothing to do with ability and at the Peter Principle that it was the Watergate time, everybody around was getting indicted. Uh, I was the only one who had a clearance. I hadn't been indicted. I knew who the men's room was and Jerry Ford knew my name. So that's, that made it. Uh, and I really, he was a real friend. And I stayed in the Carter administration because the Pentagon is a nonpartisan place. I stayed there for a while, then returned to my private business, said no more politics ever again. I was not involved in Reagan's 1980 campaign. I was not involved in his first presidential year. Uh, but at the end of 81, he decided that having taken care of the economy, uh, he decided he had decided from the beginning he wanted to focus on the Cold War. Uh, and so he recruited Bill Clark to become his national security advisor. Clark and I had been uh, worked together in Sacramento. and so. Uh, the president uh, recruited me to come work at the National Security Council, which I did for two years. Okay. And um, tell us why you decided to write this book. There's lots of books out on Reagan, but yours tells a very unique story in a different perspective. Well, Bill, this book is not a, you know, full disclosure, it is not a thoughtful Reagan biography or history. It is not Reagan hagiography about how he walked on water every morning. Or how I, whatever, it is not hero worship. I happen to have known, known him exceedingly well. I lived with him during the 60s. And you know, when you campaign, you do some of that in LA, but you do some of it in Sacramento and Eureka, and you, know, you share a hotel room. And after speeches is when you sit and talk. So I really knew him. Uh, I wrote some earlier, I wrote a Cold War history called uh, At the Abyss. I then wrote a, a, history, a book about nuclear proliferation called The Nuclear Express. And, uh, and then my editor said, you know, you've got all these files about 1968, and nobody else has that, and nobody else knows that he ran. Why don't you write it down? So I started, and then the publisher said, we don't care what Reagan had for breakfast in 68. What made him tick? And so I turned my attention to writing a story about what made Reagan tick, and that's what this book about. What makes him think? And I wrote it because 
I had the facts and because I'd by then connected with a really good editor. And so this book is really well written and it's a fun, it's really enjoyable read and that's because I didn't write it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned um, when you were talking about your background and your career, you mentioned that the first time you really noticed Reagan was the time for choosing speech, which he gave in October of 64 on behalf of Senator Goldwater. What was it about that speech that caught your attention? I think the one thing about the time for choosing speech is it resonated with the book I had read and discussed with my father, which was Whitaker Chambers' book called Witness. And it was Whitaker Chambers' story about how he had been a communist, uh, how in the 30s he had concluded that was not a good idea, it didn't work. That communism, terrific ideas, but it takes terror to make it work. In his book, he has a wonderful line. Who says he's, somebody asked him, uh, him and associate, why did you give up communism? You were a party member and everything was working out. Why did you give up communism? And he said, quote, one night in Moscow, I heard the screams. He understood that it involved terror. And Witness really got my attention because it was, it, was, it was published just as I was graduating from college. And uh, uh, it just, uh, uh, you know, Chambers said, by the end of the decade, this country is going to be all communist or all free. And, and I thought that was probably likely true. And therefore, I really was paying attention to the Soviet Union and communism and so forth and so on. And uh, when I heard Reagan's speech, he quoted some of the lines from Witness. And I said, now he's coming from the same place I am. Okay. Okay. Now, many people, especially at the time that uh, Reagan was serving in politics, not only as, as governor, but as president, uh, really didn't think he was that smart or intellectually curious. Did they underestimate him? No, they did not underestimate him. They totally misunderstood. If there's one thing that... that nobody understands and and a lot of people don't want to hear is Reagan's mind is immense beyond belief. It is fast beyond belief. When we started in the gubernatorial races uh, in 65, 66, the incumbent governor of California started off by saying Ronald Reagan is a dumb actor. If you start there, you've already lost. It is hard to believe, it's hard to understand. Reagan's mind, think of Reagan's mind is one of today's laptops, and all the rest of us are mainframe computers powered by vacuum tubes. His mind was immense. He remembered what he heard. You didn't have to write him, you never had to write him memos unless there were signature required kind of action memos. You tell him something, it's there, and it stays there until he needs it a month later. And I had an experience for doing research for him, and I told him some stuff after a speech. You know, he nodded, yes. A month later, he's at a press conference and the question comes up, you know, how do you think you can run for governor who had no experience? And out came my words, word for word. The grammar is better, the delivery is terrific, but Reagan has a retentive mind you can't believe. And it is a speed you can't believe. And therefore, if you start out, he's, you know, the, the Democrats did uh, uh, Clark Clifford when Reagan arrived at the presidency. Clark Clifford said, uh, you know, announce his arrival in town, Reagan is an amiable dunce. If you start there, you've lost. The KGB studying the new Reagan said he's unsophisticated, and Gorbachev, when he finally came to power, thought, you know, Reagan's a movie actor. You, lo you already lost. Immense mind. Yeah. Now, um, he was a supporter, a big supporter of President Roosevelt uh, during the, the, the Depression and the war, and yet he turned out to be a conservative champion. How did he make that conversion, and, and what was the source of his zeal for that? He was, that's really a very interesting process. He wasn't just a supporter of, of Roosevelt. He believed in Roosevelt. He appreciated Roosevelt. He was raised in the Depression. His father didn't have a job. Uh, and they lived in downstate Illinois, and, and, and the, uh, the New Deal basically got them through those days. He was a believing um, yeah, Roosevelt, New Dealer, uh, and that he carried those beliefs with him as he grew up. When the war came along, he was a believer in Roosevelt as our wartime president, but the first drop fell. He, you know, his eyesight is terrible, so he couldn't get in the Air Force to fly, so he was making true training movies. And he was appalled that he's making movies for the guys that are going to fly over Berlin, 
and and the, the civilians working with them are not doing nine to five jobs, and they, well, oh, we can't get this done today, we'll do it Monday. We needed the films now. He was really struck by the fact that the civilians working for the government didn't really have the message that this is a war. That was the first job. He then became the uh, active in the Screen Actors Guild. He was elected to six or seven terms as president of the Screen Actors Guild, which is the actors' union, because that was an era of of, of movies being made into television shows. And the actors wanted to get paid residuals when the movies were reshown. And of course, the studios said absolutely not. And Reagan basically was the one that organized the strikes and so forth and finally extracted agreements for residuals. He was a very successful, successful head of the Screen Actors Guild. Okay, then uh, the problem after the war, the communists, the, the active communist organizers are trying to take over Hollywood, including the Screen Actors Guild. And they are beginning to send people to meetings and pack the meetings and so forth. And Reagan uh, stood up to them and basically threw them all out. One day on the job, <clears throat> on the filming job, he gets a call on the cell phone. And it is an anonymous voice threatening him with acid in the face if he doesn't stop boycotting and obstructing the communist takeover of the Union. The Burbank police said, you got a problem. They, gave, they offered protection. They also offered him, uh, gave him a permit to carry a concealed weapon. Not well known that during his closing days as head of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan was packing heat. That really got him to understand that, that communism is really a threat to, to safety, security, well-being. Then, uh, but he was still a supporter of Roosevelt and Truman, and he thought Truman you know, was doing a great job, fallen president and Truman. And he supported Truman in uh, Truman's uh, election effort in 48. Uh, but then Korea came along, and, and he and I had the same feelings. Korea started, right thing to do, North Korea invaded, but it went on and on and on, just like Vietnam did for a more recent generation. And so, you know, we go in, the Chinese are involved, 50 turns into 51, turns into 52, and it's a meat grinder. And it, you know, I talked to my friends about that, and I listened to MacArthur uh, coming home from Korea, saying there's no substitute for victory. Truman was not really prepared to do the hard things to win. It was just a meat grinder. That struck Reagan as unfair, and therefore in 1952, early 52, he wrote to Dwight Eisenhower, the returning general and the returning hero, <clears throat> and offered to urge Eisenhower to help and or to run for office, and Reagan offered to help, and he did. And so that was a beginning of the Eisenhower-Reagan relationship. Reagan was still a Democrat, but he campaigned for Eisenhower in 52. Again, in 56, Eisenhower ran, uh, that uh, Reagan helped him, uh, that he was now, he'd come to know Eisenhower quite well. That's a whole other story. Eisenhower was a Reagan mentor. He came to know Nixon and he began to help. Uh, and he really, he made the statement at that time, uh, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, they left me. And the actual change came in 1962. He's at a campaign fundraiser in his hometown. And a lady in the audience says, have you re-registered? Re you sound like a Republican to me, have you re-registered? And he said, no, not yet. And she had her notepad with her, she rushes up and says, sign here, and now you're a Republican. <laughs> it was a long process. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, take us back to the first campaign in 66, the gubernatorial campaign. What qualities did you see in Ronald Reagan at that point that you saw on display, you know, in his, in his presidential campaigns and in his days as president of the United States? Well, as a candidate, it changed, but in 66, his, uh, his key traits, first of all, was his immense mind. And if you start working with him, or if you sit down with him after a speech, when you really, you know, there's no agenda and he's just decompressing. But if you travel with him, it's this immense mind and the ability to, you know, he doesn't need a script. He doesn't need to be afraid of the press. They need to be afraid of him. He's an absolute professional. So first of all, it was the scope of his mind and his ability to deal with crowds anywhere. Um, secondly, uh, it was this ability to connect. That's really what you want in a candidate. You don't really care how they stand on right to life or taxes or any of that stuff. What counts, what counts to the voters is 
when the rubber hits the road, do I trust this person to do what's right for me? Reagan had that ability. He had the ability to connect no matter the highest level or the lowest level. In the campaign, 1966, I'm his Northern California chairman. I'm very young, I'm very naive. Uh, and we are trying, our plan is to, to pay attention to the editors of the small town papers. And so we had one day in the spring, we had a date to meet with the editor of the Healdsburg Tribune, Healdsburg in Sonoma County. They grow grapes and apples there. Uh, so I picked Reagan up in San Francisco to drive him up, the two of us driving up to Healdsburg, it's an hour drive. And I had done all the work, as an eager young staffer will do, about water in Sonoma County, because water was a big issue. You need it for grapes, you need it for apples, and the Corps of Engineers were fooling around and planning to re reverse the flow of the Eagle River and, and flood Round Valley and so forth. Boy, Reagan got an hour of my brilliance on water. We get there, and we open the door to the Healdsburg Tribune, wooden floor, but you couldn't see it because it's covered with blood. The editor has just killed a rattlesnake, and two pieces of this rattlesnake are still twirling around on the floor. I'm absolutely horrified. Let's get out of here right now. Reagan was the master. He immediately started talking about, you know, those are dangerous critters. And then he starts talking about a rattlesnake that spooked his horse on the trail. And then he starts talking about the exchange, you know, if you're going to, you got to kill cattle. The rattlesnakes aren't smart, but they're quick. And you can't use a gun in your office because you make a hole in the floor, so you better use a shovel. They sit there for half an hour and talk about how to kill rattlesnakes. I am, of course, just appalled. All my brilliant research wasted. Uh, and at the end of half hour, they leave, you know, Reagan leaves. They two shake hands. They are lifetime buddies. The editor was a lifelong Democrat, but boy, we're going to support Ronald Reagan. He understands me. That's what he was. He could do that. He could connect with anybody, whether it's the newspaper editor <coughs> in the office in Healdsburg or whether it's over television and the time to choosing speech to lean in people. He could connect, and it was really race, really amazing. And thirdly, he basically heard, got the inspiration from Eisenhower, the big tent. When you're running for office, you don't cross people off or say, we don't want your help. He had a great expression about that, you know, the episode I remember, the Hell's Angels endorsed him. And everybody said, well, yo, that, we know what that means. No, what it means is, and Reagan said, no, they, they bought my philosophy. I haven't bought theirs. Same thing with the John Birch Society. His attitude, if you hear what I have to say and you agree, come on in. And I don't care color, race, sex, beliefs, left, right, follow me. And so those were, he could connect, he was smart, and he had a big tent. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about before about the campaign that not a lot of people have really paid much attention to. That's the 68 presidential campaign. And if I recall correctly, he, you know, the Reagans decided to get in pretty late into that when it was uh, basically a convention, convention driven. Was there really a chance to win that? Was that a wise choice? Well, was it a chance to win? It was a wise choice. That's a lot of things in life. We answer those two questions differently. but. Um, 68 is an interesting story, and that's why I started writing this book. And you'll find the full story in there. It was a real campaign. He didn't start later. Seven days after the election, I got involved in Reagan's gubernatorial campaign because I wanted to see to it Lyndon Johnson did not get elected again, and that everybody knew Nixon couldn't win anything. We had to have a candidate, and to me, Reagan was it. Okay. So seven days after the election, I, during the closing days, he asked if I wanted to come to Sacramento. No, I don't want to do that. I want, to, I want to build the prairie fire. What we talked about in the campaign, if Reagan wins, it will illuminate and ignite a prairie fire across the country. And I said, that's what I want to do. Seven days after election, I, uh, uh, to the Spencer Roberts pros, to the staffers, went to Ron and Nancy's house, and we said, okay, now that's done, and I want to start collecting delegates for the 1968 convention. And we talked about that, and basically, what he said, his, his answer was, yeah, that's okay, you can do that. Uh, I'm busy, I gotta be governor, I gotta learn how to be governor, uh, and so please don't get in the way, um, but that's okay if you do that. And I said, okay, now to do that, I'm gonna hire these guys, and I'm gonna go recruit Cliff White, and I'm gonna go collect the Goldwater organization, and I'm gonna find Peter Donald in Texas, and you know, I'm not just gonna sit around and read books. 
And he basically said, yeah, that's okay. And so starting with that, and through the early years of the administration, I was really beginning to collect the pieces, the people that could control delegates. Uh, come the summer of his first gubernatorial year, uh, 67, uh, uh, you know, he really was rolling, but then he sort of, you know, he became too visible and it sort of became, made him nervous and Nancy nervous. And so in the summer to fall of 67, he decided, no, let's stop doing this. Well, you can't take the switch and turn it on and off. We had made dates with Strom Thurmond, Barry Goldwater, uh, the Texas heavies and so forth. And he went to meet with them and basically just talked about football. And so there was no closing and sort of sort of drifted uh, until uh, 1968 began to unfold. And, uh, and then he, he talked with Eisenhower a lot because Eisenhower was his mentor and Eisenhower was his advisor on Vietnam. And he really was disturbed about Vietnam. So he began to run seriously. Um, but then in March of 68, Lyndon Johnson announces he's not gonna run and Bobby Kennedy is in. That was a big siren. That's a whole, that gets to be your next question, Bill, because Bobby Kennedy was the absolute villain for a bunch of reasons. Bobby Kennedy is in, Ronald Reagan is in, pow. And so starting in March, uh, uh, Reagan is campaigning. He's, we, we charter a 727, we got a 40 Newsies in the back of the plane, we have a trailer in Miami, and it is really rolling. In June uh, of 68, Kennedy gets killed, and now it's sort of, it is not, the fire isn't in his belly anymore. It's, I know where this country ought to go, so I'm gonna keep running. And we were working and the, the convention was close because it was decided by the chairman of a few delegations. Um, but the interesting thing about that whole story, which also illuminates his mind, is 15, 20 years later, he writes his memoirs. And you know, he's after president more than that. And as regarding 1968, there are two sentences in his memoirs. And they say, I didn't run in 1968. And my editor and I, well, that's one of the reasons for writing this book. My editor, I read this, this, this makes no sense at all. Of course he ran. He was in this airplane, we're in the trailers and so forth. You see, Ronald Reagan could not, he, he, he was not, he had a burning ambition ambition, but he was the toughest competitor the world has ever seen, and he could not deal with defeat. And in those cases, when defeat happened, they just got erased. That's what Iran-Contra was all about. Iran-Contra really was, got screwed up for a bunch of reasons, but when he made his statement, statement in front of television, he said, you know, I'm sorry about this and that, but he closed by saying, in my heart, I know I did not trade arms for hostages. He did not deal with defeat. He just simply couldn't. He was the toughest competitor that ever happened. That's why we ended and won the Cold War, which is another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I probably can't ask all the questions, but I'll leave plenty for, for our audience to ask because I know they'll want to ask you too. But uh, talk a little bit then about the 76 campaign. Um, obviously, uh, you know, former Governor Reagan at that point uh, got in the race against President Ford, who had been appointed, obviously, to be vice president for President Nixon. Uh, what were your thoughts on the 76 Reagan effort, which, which wound up in Kansas City? It was the last national convention that people really didn't know how it was going to conclude when the convention started. But what were your thoughts on that election? Well, I, I was working at the Pentagon, and I thought Reagan running was a bad idea because I basically I believe the Republican Party has the right moral principles, uh, and we had a Republican president, and there's no history of any party um, dismissing, uh, or, you know, abandoning its incumbent president and keeping the presidency. Secondly, Gerald Ford was a really terrific guy. He had become a friend of mine. So I was not involved in the campaign, but I saw it and I watched it. First of all, um, strangely enough, the fuel, the spark, comes from Ford keeping the cabinet he inherited from Nixon, including Henry Kissinger. In Reagan's mind, Henry Kissinger equals detente. And detente is a plan for losing as slowly as possible, not for beating the communists. And therefore, if Ford keeps Kissinger, and Kissinger is now organizing Vladivostok summits and so forth, then Reagan concludes harshly that you know Ford doesn't know what he's doing as president, and you better get in. Um, that. Uh, uh, there were other 
you know, Ford was just busy. You know, Ford had far too much to do. That's why he kept the cabin that he was issued. Um, and so he basically didn't have time to pay attention to Reagan. And you need to do that. And, uh, and then at the same time, Reagan wasn't decisive. It was time for some sharp actions. You know, after Watergate by October in the pardon, it was time for Reagan to decide what to do. He didn't do that. He just so went home, began to make speeches, went to the CPAC conference, made a big hit. Uh, and then his staffers in his PR office uh, started to accept speaking dates and saying you ought to run. And so his staff, uh, you know, started creating a campaign, but he did not reach out to recruit the talent you need to run a campaign. He seldom did that. He was one of the worst managers I've ever known. Brilliant in many ways, but not capable of running anything. And so in 76, uh, when this sort of campaign was beginning, he just sort of accepted whoever walked in. Uh, and they got the convention. Uh, I'm a stronger believer in Stu Spencer knew how to, to count votes, and barring some surprise issue like the Panama Canal, Spencer knew where the votes were. So it wasn't undecided in his mind, and I wasn't involved, I wasn't there. Um, but it was, it was a very unfortunate time. And, uh, and that, that same process of not recruiting talent almost did him in in 1980, because 1980, uh, you know, he's old and so forth, but there's sort of no other candidates. He decides he ought to run. He does. But he accepts the same guys in his press office and uh, the people outside the door. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's losing in the spring. Nancy Reagan recruits Bill Casey to at least raise some money because they're in debt. Uh, but by June, Reagan is seven points behind Carter and his campaign is a mess. And Nancy is the one that has the sense to call up Stu Spencer and say, come fix it, just as you got recruited to fix another campaign. Uh, and, and Stu Spencer came and really gave it discipline, and that led to the recruitment of a whole bunch of people who knew what they were doing. And if you do the structure right, you know, Reagan is such an incredible candidate that, that uh, he put it together himself. Why would, do you believe Reagan was so successful as a, as a leader and a political figure? Reagan was successful as a leader for, I think, the reasons we talked about. The one that people just don't, don't want to hear and don't believe is the immensity of his mind and the speed of his mind. Uh, that uh, he was successful with his ability to connect. That sort of gets to, to, you know, how the Cold War ended and his ability to connect with Gorbachev. He could connect with the editor in Healdsburg, but he connected with Gorbachev. He put together a plan of how to end the Cold War. Uh, and, and you know, now we've not talked about, but Eisenhower was his mentor. Once 64 was over, Eisenhower walked, watched the time for choosing speech. Eisenhower starts trying to rebuild the Republican Party uh, in, in early 65. And he knew Reagan from campaigns, but he didn't know what Ronald Reagan was all about. So we know that, that Eisenhower starts calling up his golfing buddies in California saying, tell me about this guy. I mean, tell me about his brains and his moral strength and so forth. We know all that because presidential libraries are a great place. Every time Eisenhower called anybody up, somebody made a note. So we see all these calls of Eisenhower checking on Reagan, and he starts talking to him in 66, glad you're running. And once he won the primary, um, Eisenhower then invited uh, Reagan to come meet with him at Gettysburg. I was fortunate enough to be there. Uh, and, and, he, and Eisenhower really became his mentor about Big Tent, uh, which was, I think, a big part of the success. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more questions, and we'll open it up to Q&A from our audience. But um, we're getting ready for a presidential election next year. And a lot of, well, and obviously President Reagan is now the gold standard of the Republican Party, and all the candidates are falling all over themselves trying to explain why they're more like Reagan than the other guy. I mean, what's, your, what's your take on all of that? You can't do that. Uh, that I can understand why they try to do that, but uh, you know, when I sit there and I think, you know, I'd really like to be like Mickey Mantle, but I'm not. I really like baseball, but I can't. Uh, we're all different. Uh, Ronald Reagan was not Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he wasn't Bill Clinton. Uh, he he wasn't Dwight Eisenhower. He's himself, and all these characters out there are themselves, uh, and you can say. You know, I plan to observe and follow Reagan's recipes, being inclusive. I think that's very important. You know, we want, you want you all to come in. You can't just run as a Republican. You've got to get everybody to agree if you know what you're doing. Um, but basically, the, uh, the candidates, 
I can understand why they're saying it, but to say I'm going to be just like Ronald Reagan, can't do that. Any more than I can say I'm going to be just like Mickey Mantle. No, I'm not. I will strike out the first time. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on any of the candidates that you want to share about, about them as a group of candidates? I think generically, I, I know some of them quite well, uh, and, and some I don't. But generically, uh, I, am, I, I happen to like the idea of retired war heroes like Dwight Eisenhower. It's not clear we have any of those. Secondly, I really think that successful candidates and successful go presidents need to have served time as governors not just one term. They've served, got elected, done a good job as governor, got reelected like Reagan did, big time, and then they make them candidates. I am very suspicious of congressmen and senators uh, running for the presidency um, because members of Congress don't have to make a decision today. If there's a problem, you refer it to, let, to wait till after the recess or at least the committee on Monday. If you're a governor, there's a prison riot. What are you gonna do? right now. And so just generically, uh, I, I like the idea of governors uh, who have been elected once, done a good job, been reelected, you know, with a heavy margin, uh, and uh, that seem to know what they're doing. And, you know, there's several, several of those in the race, and there's some that aren't in the race. My favorite governor happens to be the one in New Mexico, because a lot of my new Los Alamos friends live there. And Susanna Martinez really cleaned up a very blue state after Richardson's terrible dose of corruption. So I think she's one of the greatest, but she's not a candidate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was a very interesting poll done by um, a very reputable uh, uh, educational polling firm called Quinnipiac uh, a year ago, uh, back in July. And they asked voters who they felt was the best president since World War II. And Reagan won that by a, a rather large margin. I think 35% selected Reagan and 18% selected Clinton and everybody else was below that. But why, would, why is Reagan still revered that way? I don't know about the body politic, but I know about a lot of people that I talk to and know, and it's because he put the pieces in place to end the Cold War. Now, a lot of us here understand how terrible that could have turned out. I've designed and fired nuclear weapons. They are not bigger hand grenades. That one nuke going off is the sun coming to Earth. It is disaster beyond belief. And the US and the Soviets had thousands. And Reagan put the pieces in place to end the Cold War. Let me, let me give you a story of how that worked. Because I was there, I helped put the pieces together. I was working at the White House. I was not the genius, I was just the chief clerk. But the point is, I go to work, I come to the White House, I'm there in my second week of work in 1982. My buddy from Sacramento, Bill Clark, is the National Security Advisor and Special Assistant for Policy. We meet with Reagan every morning at 9 o'clock. And we bring the news in the Situation Room about when some crazy person is done in Honduras and so forth. We get through with all that on the second week I'm there, and he peers over his glasses, as he's wont to do when he's made a decision. He says, you know, Tom, we got a problem here. I said, yes, Mr. President, meaning the air conditioning doesn't work right. We got a problem here. I said, yes, what is that? The Soviet Union. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a problem. And he then starts to say, okay, now it's time to end the Cold War. Tom, I want you to get the intelligence about their economy. I want you to talk to the military guys about technology. I want you to, you know, collect all the pieces. And then I want you to put together a plan for ending and prevailing in the Cold War. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, for I was still, you know, a kid in my 40s, and this is pretty heavy stuff. And it wasn't, you know, you do it. It was get all these people. I was the chief collector. I then ended it by saying, well, okay, so what's the end game, Mr. President? How do you, how do you see this ending? And you know, how, how does the Cold War end? And I envisioned him saying, okay, we're gonna have a peace conference in Geneva and we'll split up the world or something. One sentence, simple, two sentences. Simple, Tom, we win, they lose. That's the way he was. He was absolutely decisive and he knew where he was going and, and that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so we put together, we do the staffing for all that. Um, we take our time, about once a month, I meet with the National Security Council and brief them what we've learned and where we're going. Uh, and in April, I've basically got the plan put together. It's, it's basically 
we're going to wage a non-shooting war with the Soviet Union on five fronts. Economic, no more credits. Uh, military, meaning technology, SDI and aircraft, we're not going to invade any place. Um, covert action, we call it politically, but it means covert actions. Working with your allies, that's easy to do if they all speak English and wear coats and ties, but our allies were in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, and we were going to turn Afghanistan into the Soviets, Vietnam, which we did. Uh, and lastly, information, which is Reagan himself speaking to the people behind the Iron Curtain. That's what the Iron, that's what the Evil Empire speech was. It was Reagan speaking to the people behind the Iron Curtain. That was the plan, and we had sense enough to think through, to listen to uh, some sound advice, which I've heard repeated very well uh, by Bob Gates, a Secretary of Defense, a terrific Secretary of Defense who made the point over and over again, and in his book, if you're going to get into a fight, figure out how you're going to get back out. Don't just start and think, we'll work things out as we go along, or gradualism or something like that. That's what we did. We took, we decided in writing up our, our decision memorandum, NSDD 32, we put together what's the end game. And we took that right from the Declaration of Independence. We, it's not, we want to burn down Berlin. It's not tanks in Red Square toppling statues of Lenin. Quote, we want to force the Soviet Union to seek the consent of the governed. That means every time there's an there's, that the Soviets want something, we're going to say, yeah, you can buy some wheat, but by the way, you haven't had any elections recently. Pretty soon, Boris Yeltsin is mayor of Moscow. Pretty soon, another guy has been elected president of Ukraine. Pretty soon, the presidents of Kazakhstan and Ukraine are meeting in Minsk to figure out how to disassemble the Soviet Union. Pretty soon, pretty soon they're in Alma Ata, and all 19 of them signed the dissolution agreement. And then the end game is Gorbachev picks up the phone to call Bush 41 at Christmas of 91 and said, I've turned over the nukes to, to Yeltsin because the Soviet Union is gone. So we figured out how to, to uh, put it all together, and uh, Reagan was decisive enough to do that. But in putting this plan together, I was presenting this to the National Security Council, uh, in April, and this is sort of the final draft. And I reviewed all this. The gurus around the table, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, well, you know, uh, Maggie Thatcher's country sells a lot of pumps to the Russians, and you really can't do boycotts. And, and then, you know, the Soviets, they're only spending 16% of GDP on defense, and too bad if you're a Russian, but it's stable. And then the State Department, yeah, though they're stable people, and they got good control, and they're going to be there forever. And Reagan, again, peered over his glasses and said, I don't think so. I think we can push them over backwards. They're going broke. The guy in back of him that decided the Cold War, really, was a guy named Harry Rowan, who was from, he's back at Stanford, an economist. He was chairman of the Intelligence Council, which is a bunch of outsiders that sort of give advice to the CIA. Harry Rowan said, Mr. President, you're right. They're spending at least half of their GDP on defense. They're going broke. You can push them over backwards. The guy on his right, who sort of had the supporting paperwork, said and quoted some statistics. My economist from the NSC, Norm Bailey, uh, said, yeah, and other quotes. I chimed in with a closer that I'm, I'm an economist, but I'm a businessman. And I looked at the Soviets pumping oil, just held no reservoir engineering pumping oil, hell for leather, because they got to have money tomorrow, dumping gold. I concluded Russia was not a place I'd send to spell money to, send loan money to. And so Reagan listened to all that, and he smiled again over his glasses. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to push him over backwards. Tom, write it that way. And so he decided to end the Cold War, and he understood that the Soviet economy uh, could not withstand a frontal assault from the U.S. So uh, that's a very long answer to why I like Ronald Reagan and why I think he's a hero is at least our generation understands he ended the Cold War and that had such a potential for disaster. And we owe him so much for that. Okay. We're going to open it up to your Q and uh, your questions. Uh, if you would please raise your hand and Claire will bring a mic by so we can get your, your question on our video. Thank you for a wonderful explanation. And now I want to take you back 47 years to 1968 in Miami Beach. I was then running for a third term for the Senate in Kansas, the state Senate, and I was considerably younger than you. 
but my late wife and I had the pleasure of working with you, with Cliff White, Lynn Knopfsinger, Skip Watts, and John Kerwitz. And I will uh, disagree with you slightly as to the reason that Reagan did not get nominated. I believe it all came down to the Florida delegation and that guy, Governor Kirk, <laughs> who was to the Republican Party what Mayor Daley was to the Democrat Party in 68. He strong-armed all of the state employees who were delegates, and they got more than 50%, and under their unit rule, they, the whole state went for, <laughs> for uh, that's, Nixon. A, that's not a question, and B, it's a story I don't want to hear because it's absolutely right. And, you know, I'm, out, I'm shaking my head. I'm out of here. I mean, you got a better speaker here who knows the history cold. That's absolutely the way it was. The way, the reason it was so close is Florida, the state chairman was Bill Murfin, okay, and the governor was Kirk, and Mississippi, Clark Reed was the state chairman, basically had gotten the rules so that their delegations operated by the unit rule. And so the delegations didn't get to vote. They voted in caucus, and then once the, if Nixon got the votes, then Nixon got all the votes from Mississippi and all the votes from Florida, and that's what put him over the top. If exactly right, sir. If, if Kirk had not muscled those employees and the, if the unit rule had broken, Nixon would not have gotten it on the first vote, and it was very clear. I need to move on to another. Sir, I, I'm sorry. I need to make sure other folks get a chance to ask questions. If you want to come back in a few minutes, we'll pick you back I'm, I'm going to be right here, and I'd love to talk to you some more. I uh, just wanted a clarification on the dates. Did I understand that in, after Bobby announced that Ronald Reagan and you saw Ike and he was giving advice to Reagan at that point on how to run? But the question was, what, was, was he saying anything to Richard Nixon at the same time? Was he advising both or was he advising Reagan and not advising Nixon positively? Um, the, the, the Bobby Kennedy, that's worth talking about for a minute. The, the, the advice... You know, when Bobby got came in, that was not a time for advice. That was the, that was the grenade is in the fire. Why is that? Because when Bobby Kennedy became Attorney General, uh, he then impaneled a grand jury to look into Ronald Reagan's management of the Screen Actors Guild, claiming a conflict of interest. Uh, and then two weeks after, they, you know, show up at the grand jury without your lawyer. Two weeks later, he subpoenas all the Reagan's tax returns. About a month after that. Ralph Cordner calls Ronald Reagan and said, you know, I got a call from Bobby Kennedy and they're threatening to cancel our engine contracts unless we end the General Electric Theater and get you off the air. Those, you know, that may not have been exactly what happened, but that's what was in Reagan's mind. I know that from talking to his friend, his son Michael, who was at the Sunday dinner when Ron talked about this stuff. Ronald Reagan bitterly resented Bobby Kennedy and, when, and then there had been, you know, a, 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 other events. When Bobby Kennedy was in, Reagan saw this as the great chance for the grand settlement on the biggest stage of all time. And to the competitor, he said, oh boy, this is the chance. I'm going to give it to that guy. And when, and when Kennedy is gone, he sort of, well, I'm running. Okay, I know how to be president. But the fire was gone. But it was the antipathy for Kennedy and what Kennedy, Reagan thought Kennedy had done to his career. Um, no, we weren't advising. We didn't talk to Nixon, and we, you know, and Eisenhower wasn't involved in that. By that time, uh, uh, you know, he I, I believe he had died. He died in '67. <clears throat> it was basically Reagan was on fire because of Kennedy. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you for bringing up, bringing up that uh, Reagan Eisenhower nexus. It's particularly fascinating. But I want to ask a question that uh, avails of your expertise and particular vantage point on national security. Again, thinking perhaps comparing Reagan to Eisenhower and the critiques of the current president, can you explain how engaged Reagan was in national security decision making? Was he an avid consumer of intelligence? Did he push for information requirements? And was he involved in the ultimate outcomes? I'm sorry, what was the question? What how engaged was Ronald Reagan in the national security how, and how intelligence had yeah. process? Did, how much did he pay attention to intelligence and information and he study? He didn't tinker in anything. Um, he, he was a master of the political stage. He basically did not tinker with stuff. Um, he was engaged 
in national security, not in, you know, do we buy the B-1 or stealth bombers and so forth. To back up, he's leaving Los Angeles, flying to the convention in Detroit in 1980. Stu Spencer is riding with him. Stu Spencer has just been hired to try to salvage this campaign. And Stu asks him in route, why are you running for, you know, why are you running? That's a question you ought to ask your candidates. Why are you running? Boom, to end the Cold War. The Cold War is going on in too long. When he gets to the presidency, he deals with the economy, inflation, all that stuff, because he knows he has to do it. But he also tells Weinberger, go rebuild the defenses, peace to strength. And so he basically, he wasn't involved in, in what do we do about stealth bombers, but he, he basically told Weinberger, you know, go rebuild our defenses. So a year from now, you know, we got some cards to play. SDI and the, the Star Wars and so forth. That was not a thoughtful defense decision. It was almost a religious belief that nuclear weapons are terrible. But it was also an understanding the Soviet technology is not working. It's been actually it's been poisoned by our good intelligence work. Uh, and that the Soviets are not going to be able to compete. So in the big picture, he was, you know, SDI was his creation. It was, you know, he got some encouragement from some members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But he was really focused on the big picture. We're going to beat the Soviets and the, and the important issues. But they're more than just, you know, not just military. Okay. I have a question around here, Claire. I have to ask you about your impressions of Nancy Reagan. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Question is impressions of Nancy Reagan. The positive side is he would not have been president without her. Strangely enough, Ronald Reagan was devoid of ambition, political ambition. In movie land, he wanted to do a good job, be paid well, to support his family well. He did not have a burning need to be a star. In politics, in, in, in policy matters, he thought through, he knew what he believed, he gave speeches, he supported Eisenhower, uh, and he knew what he believed, and he gave the time for choosing speech. But strangely enough, he did not have a burning need to be president or governor. He knew what to do, and he was you know, very self-confident. No, I know, I know better than those guys, but, but right now I'm busy with my horse. Let me give you some quotes on that subject. Maureen, uh, talking about Nancy in Maureen, his daughter's memoirs, says, Sorry, Nancy, Dad's horse is his best friend. <laughs> uh, Lynn Nossinger, uh, his press secretary, said Reagan would have made a superb hermit. In Nancy's memoirs, she said, Ronnie doesn't let anybody get too close to him. There's a wall around him, a barrier. John Sears, his manager in 76. As the, as the second son of an alcoholic, Reagan grew up to be a people pleaser. That's how he coped. Nancy provided the ambition. Ronald Reagan knew what to do, but he thought the perks of power were funny. Nancy provided the ambition. It was best encapsulated by Johnny Carson in the run-up to the 1981 uh, inauguration, January of 81. Johnny Carson said, you want to understand Nancy, think Ava Perona. Exactly. You may laugh, but it's, ab I mean, that's unfortunately in the book and Nancy's not too pleased. But we all agree she never would have been president or governor without her because she had the ambition and it had nothing to do with ending the Cold War. It had getting to the White House and all that stuff. Nancy Reagan was Ava Perona, whether you like it or not. And that's what drove him to the, that's a far more complicated answer than you expected. That she was difficult because she did not share any policy objectives. She shared a desire to get to the White House, the dresses, the china wear, the whole schmear. Um, and that uh, uh, Ron was the guy that, that basically she propelled forward. And so she was indispensable. Uh, and she, she, but we, we you know, she, um, she was not involved in government. I mean, that's strange. You'd think, okay, pillow talk, and she's talking about, uh-uh, absolutely not. We, whenever she tried to get involved in government, especially in the White House, in Sacramento, she didn't really care. But in government, boy, she really wanted to be involved. And her urging right early on was, you know, we got to have summit meetings. We got to meet with Mr. Brezhnev, and we need to talk peace. And, and the uh, evil empire speech, a vignette in uh, their dining room upstairs. He's just given the evil empire speech down in Florida uh, in 1963. And 
Nancy is very unhappy about how you, you know, why you say all those terrible things about the, your, our Soviet friends. They've invited Stu Spencer to dinner. And so they're having dinner in the private quarters of the White House. Nancy, Ronald Reagan, Stu Spencer. Nancy is on his case about the evil empire speech. You can't be saying those terrible things. We've got to work for peace. Um, Ron, you know, he's having dinner. He looks over. He's having mac and cheese. He looks over at, at Spencer. Stu, what do you think? Spencer was sort of a steady politician. He said, well, you know, you're going to scare a lot of people. It is an evil empire, um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it may be you ought to be careful about what you say. And he smiled and said, it's an evil empire, Stu. We're going to push him over backwards. Honey, what's for dessert? <laughs> Those are the exact quotes. She was the ambitious one. He didn't care what she thought about the Cold War. She was the protector. She was indispensable. She ran the capital. She wasn't a friend, but she was the capsule. She was the surrogate for Ron's mother. Ron's father was an alcoholic, a happy drunk, but he couldn't keep a job. His mother, Nell, her picture was on the White House desk. Mother Nell moved the family house to house, took in laundry, and kept them all together. And, and he was so dedicated to his mother. And when life takes a turn, yes, Nancy was wife and lover and all that stuff, mother of the children. But as the years progressed, she became the capsule. And that was it. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> OK, do we have any other questions? OK, Tom, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Tom out so he can sign books. So if you'd like to pick up a copy of his book out there, they're for sale. Or you could just get in line to say hello to him. So thank you all for coming out. <laughs> thank you so much.